I wish I had a stool this afternoon because today to celebrate Mother's Day and also typically May is a family awareness month. So we're going to pause one week uh, to talk about Book of Romans, but instead we are going to talk about family. And I am standing before you as vulnerable as I can be because talking about family, and I am also a husband and a father, and I cannot boldly claim that I am a good one as much as I want to honor God first because he is the builder of our house. And I want to talk on the store as, as friendly as possible because this will be, in a way, a family talk. Because we, all of us together, want to come before God and humbly ask God to build our house. House meaning the family. And unless we honor God first, it's impossible. Our works, our efforts will become just a vain. So we want us to take to the scriptures in the book of Psalms 127, how we want to honor God and we want to talk about how we can honor God and build a strong family that is healthy and happy. But there will be no perfect family. In the end, when couples get together and get married, you know, when you are single, you used to sin alone. But when you are married, you're going to sin together. Bottom line, two sinners get together, it's inevitable. We will go through the conflicts and trials and problems. But as much as we honor God, He's going to honor our family. And one sermon will not do, but we want to remind ourselves to continually honor God because He is the life giver. He is the one who has first instituted family and marriage. He is a designer of the family. So he will know perfectly how we can build healthy and strong and happy family. So let's turn our Bible to book of Psalms 127 and we'll talk about how we can honor him in our family. Book of Psalm 127 <coughs> from verse 1 through 5 and let us alternate. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up <coughs> early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he gives his beloved sleep. Behold, the children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Verse 5 all together. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. Unless the Lord builds the house, in this case, of course, he's not talking about physical building of a house. He's talking about family, a household. Unless the Lord, God himself, builds a house, all the labors, all the work and efforts and sweat of the people will become vain. It has to be God who builds our family and our house. But we are living in a... <clears throat> I'm sorry, we are living in an era above anything else in our life. The family is the most attacked and family value has been put down in such a degree and the view and value of family has been continually being challenged. Even in the midst of church life that sometimes we have a skewed view of family. And also, sometimes we wrestle with the church life and family life, which is more important. But what I believe from the Bible, the Bible never clearly says family is more important than church. Church is more important than family. What I believe, what I myself has experienced is a matter of heart. If I truly surrender my heart and my life completely to God, not only I am a child of God, but I am also a servant of God. And in this earth, I'm called to serve as Jesus himself was called 
to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. And that means whether that I go to the church, whether I go home, I am a server. And as I serve my family and as I serve my church, I realize and I find Jesus himself serving me. So it's not about matter of importance. It's not about matter of balancing. It's matter of who your God is. And if my God is God, and I respect him, and I fear him, and I love him as who he is, and invite him in every sphere of my life, and honor him first as my God, then he's going to honor my life, and he's going to honor my family, and even nation. So as we remind ourselves how to build strong, happy, healthy family, let us remind ourselves, it starts with the family, and in the family, we begin to honor God first. When we read the book of Genesis, in the chapter 18, from verses 17 and 19, God visited Abraham in due time, and later on, he's going to promise that he will again have a son, but he was on the way to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And angels came together to the house of Abraham. And initially, he was not going to reveal his plan to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, but he decided to reveal that to Abraham. And as he was revealing it, this was what the Lord said to Abraham. Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm doing? Since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, and the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. Now God called Abraham as a father of many nations. That God is promising again, through him, he's going to make mighty nation. However, even though Abraham has received a great vision as a builder of mighty nation, and he will become father of many nations, but that journey begins with his own household. Because God says, I know he will teach his children the way of the Lord. He will keep his household in order. And that's why Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy, he even said, when you select the elder in the house of God, how can you appoint a leader in the house of God when he himself cannot rule his own house? So unless we become proper leader of our family, it's impossible to be a leader in the house of the Lord. It begins in this concise family cell. And unless we have a strong and happy families, we cannot build strong church. So that's the importance of the family. Before we ask which is more important or not, it's a matter of how we honor God first, how we invite in every sphere of our life as God be our God. So, but there are a certain ways that we can honor God in the practical realm. And I want to borrow a passage from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13. And there, this is something that we all memorize. It says, And now by the faith, hope, love, these are three, but the greatest of these is love. What Apostle Paul is saying to Christians in the church of Corinth, they are abide, faith, hope, and love continually, perpetually. These will abide in our individual life, in our church life, and also in our family. As a Christians, faith, hope, and love will perpetually abide. But among them, greatest is love. Now, I'm not going to further expound why love is more important, but I want to borrow this passage to build our strong and happy family. In the family, there has to be faith, hope, and love. And love should be the greatest. Because love 
is the, all the things that bind everything we do. But let's talk about faith first. Because faith lays down the foundation. Without faith, nothing can be built. Because our journey as a Christian starts with a newborn life, the moment that I believe Jesus as my Savior. So faith lays down the foundation, Jesus being the chief cornerstone. And in that new journey with Christ, the faith invites God to be the center in our family. And that is a motivation to honor our God above anything else. So in our family, there can be many, many importances. However, if we neglect God, and however, if we do not honor God first above anything else, we will not be able to build that house. Because that's the foundation. Faith in God and inviting Him to be the center and to be our king and to be our master. You know, we are going through the Bible time and we are reading Book of Numbers. There, we will be able to see how almost two million Israelites will move together, but their life, each family had its own tent and they will pitch it in the wilderness of Sinai However, their dwelling was centered around and revolved around the tabernacle. And that tabernacle represents the presence of God. And I want to show you a slide, how it looked like. <clears throat> this was how it looked like. That's a center, tabernacle. And God commanded it in the book of Numbers uh, through Moses, each tribe, all together, 12 tribes, had their own location, south, north, east, and west. And they were centered around the tabernacle. And if we see next slide, how you can see Dan and Asher and Naphtali and each tribe, that's how they clung together. But what's important is right above the tabernacle, God will symbolically show them how he's with them, how he's walking together with the Israelites. During the daytime, there was a pillar of cloud. And during the nighttime, there was a pillar of fire. Why? Because our God not only is a fearsome God, but He's also, in a way, like a mother's very compassionate and sensitive God that He loves you and I. Because if you were to live in the wilderness during the daytime, there is a scorching heat from sun. And it's almost impossible to survive daily without shade. And right above the tabernacle, you will have a pillar of cloud creating shade for the people. And during the nighttime, the wilderness, the temperature will go down so low, it's so cold. It's a freezing cold. And you need a heat. So that pillar of cloud will change into the pillar of fire. But it's right above the tabernacle. So symbolically, what God is teaching us is no matter how large your crowd is, no matter where you are, let God be the center and your life has to circle around first honoring God. In New Testament era, even though I consider my family so important, our life has to inevitably revolve around the church life. As a Christians, you may build a family so strong, and you may want to enjoy happiness with a family. But if your church life is miserable, you will never be content. If you are miserable with a church fellowship, no matter how much strong your family life may be, as a Christian, you will never be content. Why is it? Because when we live on this earth, not only we abide in the better law, in society, but all of us are citizens of kingdom of heaven. We already belong to God, and God has a certain oracles towards his citizens. Not only we abide bodily on this earth, but we are already included in the kingdom of God. The Israelites represent, because God chose them to represent the kingdom of God and their life revolved around the tabernacle. So 
family life and church life as a Christian is inseparable. Is inseparable. Because God uses the church to bless the families. And the families also edify and strengthen the church life. And it's tied all together. So in that faith, we must, we must honor. And physically, we must honor God first in our family life. And how do we do that? We need to give a time to the Lord. And that's why Israelites, when they lived and when they scheduled out yearly schedules, their schedules revolved around seven feasts. God commanded them. The day of atonement, Passover, the Feast of Trumpet, Feast of Booth, and Feast of Weeks, and all these feasts, they must come together as a convocation to honor God together. And their yearly schedule was planned out according to God commanded a feast. So our family life intermingled together with the church life, that in that, because God is a life giver, meaning days, time, and years are gifts from the Lord. And from there, we want to consecrate certain hours and certain days to honor Him first. Because when we do not physically allow time to honor Him, we cannot claim that we love Him. As plain as that. So that's why physically, it's very important that you belong to a local church. And also, as we want to honor Jesus, his body was broken. His body was crushed so that we can live a wholesome life. We can have a healthy body. In that sense, it's now our turn physically with my own body to serve his body so that his body may be strengthened, which is his church. So I use my body to edify and strengthen his body because his body was broken so that I may live a healthy life. And that is a simple way to honor God and honor Jesus so that he can honor our family. Now secondly, there abides hope as well. Hope gives direction of our family. Faith lays down the foundation for our family. Hope gives a direction for our family. So hope also cultivates the family's vision. And I share this often. <coughs> As a couples, if couples look to each other, that's not right posture. Husband and wife looking towards each other, trying to create intimacy. It will never work. You know why? Because it, the more you look to each other, the more flaws and shortcomings you will find, the more you will be discouraged, the more you will be disappointed. The right posture as a couple is shoulder to shoulder. You to look towards God and God-given goal, which is a vision. And when you walk together towards that vision and run the race together, there will be joy created. As a couple, there's no other relationship. You are husband and wife. That's it. You cannot be a mother or child. You cannot be a mentor or mentee or teacher or student. As a married couple, the only role you play is husband and wife. However, when you run the race together towards that vision, you become also co-workers in Christ Jesus. And that brings us such joy and sense of accomplishment as you serve for the sake of his kingdom purpose. Now, even that vision, you cannot be fully separated from the church. Why? Because God always uses his church. He will never change his mind as far as institution is concerned. He's going to use the church to fulfill his master plan. That means as a family, when you cultivate your own vision, understand your church's vision. Because it's going to complement each other. You cannot have a, as a family separate vision when your church has a completely different vision. 
And all of us, we know this church started because of world mission. And our GMI overall vision is to fulfill the Great Commission. And with a larger picture, with the EM, we may rephrase that vision as this ministry wants to prepare the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's why this ministry exists. So to prepare the second coming of Jesus Christ, what do we need to do? And there comes a strategy. First, the Jewish nation has to return back to Christ. So that's why we emphasize for the nation of Israel. Secondly, every nation, tribe, must hear the name of Jesus Christ. So that's why we go to India. That's why we go to Unreached People's Group. And thirdly, when the gospel, torture of the gospel began from the city of Jerusalem and has been circling around the entire globe, and it's a returning back to Jerusalem, and as he's going back, there's a great block, obstacle, and that's the Muslim nations. And that's why we want to take the Mus gospel to the Muslim nations. And that's why these are three focuses of world mission. And to accomplish that, we need to raise our disciples within our ministry, while we enjoy worshiping God, while we try to create a healthy community, but that itself is now final goal of existence of the church. The church exists for the sake of salvation of the people. And understanding this, as your family, you need to take a part of it, whether financial stewards. That's why I'm praying for millionaires to come forward and billionaires, not so that you can live affluent life. You can enjoy that, but the focus is to fulfill God-given vision. You may, have a, you may be artistic. You may be a praise leader. You may be having different gifts and talents, but they all come together and playing its role to fulfill the master plan of God, and that is salvation of all nations. And understanding that, pray together and cultivate it together, even with your children. How do you foresee your children's life? As a father, you do have authority to bless your children. And each children has a different calling and different gifts, but as early as possible, you can recognize them and you can pray into it. For myself, I kind of know all my four children's talents. They're so different. They came from the same womb, but their personalities are so different. Characters are different. Talents are different. And I've been praying for my third child that he may become a pastor in the future, but never pressured him. But when he was six years old, randomly said, Dad, when I grow up, I want to become a pastor like you. My older son never said it. He's a politician. The way he talks from young age, man, this guy is a politi politician. So I pray someday he may become president of America. Don't say to my son, don't pray, pressure him. He already knows how I am praying. <coughs> but all for the kingdom purpose. But as family, the positive reaffirmation and positive envisioning for our children is so important. Don't look at how they are. It goes the same with the church members. As a pastor, when I look at each member, I don't look at them as who they are. I try to look at their future and bless them in my prayers and in my view as well. Because a father's a blessing carries down to their children. I want to show you this uh, uh, slide uh, because one day I was reading a book given by a friend, but inside of that book I found that this card, this card was a little bit weird. It said uh, S work. I, I, this is a copy shop invented by a mother. Her motivation was the mothers because you know, they need a, a space to chat and communicate with their friends, but they have infants and children, so they're stuck at home. So she created this coffee shop where mothers can come and enjoy coffee and tea and converse and gossip. 
So they have a playground on the side, on the coffee shop. And because her motivation was so family-oriented, and I guess this is a promotional card, and it was inside a book, and I read this, and wow, it speaks to me. And I'm not saying this is a Christian value or something, but it's about our children and our family life. And I want to show you this slide and kind of read it for you. Here it goes. If I had to raise my child all over again, I would build the self-esteem first and the house later. I would finger paint more and I would point the finger less. I will do less correcting and more connecting. I will take my eyes off my watch. Nowadays, I will take my eyes off my cell phone and watch with my eyes. I will care to know less and know to care more. I will take more hikes and fly more kites. I will stop playing serious and seriously play. I will run through more fields Engage and more stars. I will do more hugging and less tugging. I will see oak tree in the acorn more often. I will be firm less often and affirm much more. I will model less about the love of power and more about the power of love. Our children in the incubator of our love they begin to love. I mean, they begin to vision. They begin to dream. Just like a Joseph, he received God's dream. But there's a human side why it cultivated God's size of vision in his life. Because he was loved by his father, Jacob. He wore a robe of many colors. The human father's love stirred up in his heart to dream big. And when we created that kind of incubator, that kind of family environment for our children, our children will dream big. And as a father and as a mother, and we want to continually speak into their lives, blessings, affirmation, build their self-esteem, and spend time with them. Now, because their greatest need the experts say, is your presence. Now, when I say that, I'm vulnerable before you too. Because as a pastor, the ministry and mission that I can be so know about, I may end up not spending too much time with my children. But my heart never, never because I'm sold out for the sake of gospel, will neglect my relationship with my wife or my children. Sometimes I'm mistaken that way. But let me share with you, since it's a family talk time. When my oldest son was about time to go to school, I and my wife, we decided to have him homeschool. Now, having four children in the house, it's not easy, especially for my wife. But we decided that way. You know why? It was because I wanted to spend as much time as possible with our children when they are young. Because we understood my presence for them is crucial as they grow up. I'm a pastor, and I cannot spend the time with them on Saturdays. My Saturdays are fully given to prepare Sunday worship. But typically, Monday can be a freer time as a pastor. So if my son delays going to the school and stays at home and homeschooled, then we can manage the time. So we decided that Monday be the family field trip day. So that because he's just homeschooled, all four children, and every, almost every Monday, unless Pastor Han calls me, then I need to obey him that we would take a field trip on every Monday. And our kids knew that Monday was a field trip day. People think I travel so often that every opportunity, mission opportunity, I say yes to it. Absolutely not. Because I don't talk about things that I say no to them. I say many no's. 
many knows, that are still missionaries and mission field, for four or five years, insisted that I should go to them. But I kept saying no, because there is a priority in my life. And because of mission, I do not neglect my family. What if, if I accomplish gigantic mission, a world mission, but if I lose my wife, what's got to do with it? If I have no wife to share my success and God's glory, what's the meaning of life to it? What's the meaning of not life to it? When I was serving in the KM, KM ministry, there are camp pastors on Mondays because during the weekdays and ministry, it can be pressured and stressful. So they wanted to get together and do the sports on Sundays, play ping pong, play tennis, and things like that. And they've been asking me to join them. And there was a peer pressure. But I kept saying no, no to them for years. They may ostracize me, but later I found out they said it among themselves, Pastor Shiny is ostracizing us, not us to him. Why? Because that was not the highest priority. When we have a family, single brothers and sisters, the moment you decide to marry, you need to readjust your life. Because if your passion and affection and your time and resources are dispersed all over the places, then it's hard for you to build a strong family. You know, there is a magnifying lenses, magnifying glass. There is a sunlight coming in, but it's a zoomed in because it's a magnifying glass. And if you focus upon certain spot, you can even burn a paper. But the light force are scattered. You cannot burn the paper. But with a magnifying lens, you can burn a paper just like that with our passions, with our time and resources. And upon the family, we need to zoom in. And there, perhaps with my own affection, maybe I can still have a still burning heart in my wife's heart and upon my children. And when we have a children, we need to readjust our life again. But if you are still a young punk and go around with your friends, and still want to keep your old hobbies and entertainment and addicted to computer games, and your time is a scarce for your family, it's going to be very challenging to build strong family life. We need to invite God's wisdom. So in that family setting, let us focus and run the race together with God and cultivating godly vision in our family. And thirdly, which is the most important, the love will abide, and that's the greatest. Now, there can be many, many talks on love, but today, given time, I want to focus on prioritizing our love. We need to love God first. Love cannot be self-regenerated. All of us in our DNA with a fallen nature. We cannot love any single person other than myself with our own strength. We all love ourselves. Even self-pity is a negative form of self-love. It's impossible. Love cannot be self-generated. It has to come from God. Therefore, highest priority, the first, is that I love God first. As long as I love him, he's going to fill my heart with his love, and I become the channel of God's love flowing into the heart of my wife and my children. But mothers, I want to challenge you, especially mothers with the infants. Your children will challenge you. Unknowingly, you will be challenged. Your child will ask you, Mom, do you love God? Or do you love me more? In that question, with your action, you're going to answer that question. Because that temptation, that testing comes in such a naive and innocent way with your innocent infants. Because your children will distract your worship. 
your children will continually challenge your worship. No matter what, no matter what, let go of it. If your children disturb your worship, then you are not going to be spiritually fed. Then be a strong and healthy mother for your children that itself will be challenged and will be shaken. So even though your baby will be crying, we do have a crying room. And at a certain month, be bored. Entrust your baby to God. He's going to take care of you because he understands your motivation. Leave to our volunteers. Entrust your child to God. And you come before the Lord and fully worship God. And let God ravish you with his love. And your heart will be content and satisfied. And with Christ's love, your children will grow healthy. But to all parents, I challenge you. Because your children, in such, such i n n e r way, continually will ask you this question. Mom, Dad, do you love us more or do you love God? But every time you want to answer that question by honoring God first, worshiping first, and loving Him first, then God's going to honor your family. So loving God first is the highest priority. Second, loving one another between spouse. Husbands, I want us to remind ourselves, our relationship with God is the greatest importance. But in human relationships, there are many, many relationships, but our relationship with our wife is most important human relationship. She comes before my children. Again, focus on your wife. If your ministry is so busy and your wife becomes bitter, there's no excuse. Your career is so important and your wife is neglected, your career doesn't mean anything. What your career's success means anything when your wife has Set down in depression and in bitterness. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. When I share this, some guys come to me and complain, Pastor Shine, you are so biased. When you do premarital counseling or marital seminars, you hammer husbands down to love them and say, I'm sorry first and honor your wife and things like that. Let me, let me justify myself. Hey, guys, we cannot change women. But we can change us. We can decide to change our life. Can we not? And also, we are called to be the head of the house. And we are called to love our wives and our children. And when we love my children's m o t h e r that my children will be healthy. So that's why. And Christ died on the cross to win the heart of his bride, the church. And I need to die to myself to win the heart of my wife. So when we take a full responsibility as husbands, our wives will be more than happy to submit to our leadership. But to make it fair, ladies, I'm not going to talk about much on how to be a, a godly wife. Just one thing. Just one thing. Don't be so possessive of your husband. Don't be controlling of your husband. Don't be a control freak. Our society... I believe is overly emphasizing feminism. You know, one of the most despised commands of God is wives submit to your husbands. That's one of the most despised commands. And if I overly emphasize it, 
I will be called as a sexiest. That's how we are living in a culture. But no matter how much you improve your communication skill, you bring in psychology, you do everything else, inner healing, but if you bypass that command, submit yourselves to your husband, the healthy marriage will be at stake. Will be at stake. Wives, you are called to be wives, not mothers. Don't try to be mother to your husband. And you may say, Pastor Shine, my husband has not grown up. He's a still boy. See, that's why. That's why. He had a controlling mother. And that's why he's a still mama boy. Because his mother was a control freak. Now he's married to you. If you control him, when is he going to grow up? Wives. Allow your husbands to fail. Wives, allow husbands to make wrong decisions. They have their God. Entrust them to God. But with your attitude, with your lifestyle, with your submissiveness, win their hearts. Some ladies say, Pastor Shine, I made a wrong choice. No, you didn't. You are two of kinds. But when you are committed to each other and to God, there's always a solution. I was stricken with awe, and I was very pleasantly surprised by reading a book by Tim Keller. The book was The Meaning of Marriage. And in there, he said, because of the marriage and families has been so challenged in our society, there was a... a Mary is a project done by University of Virginia. And that concluded out of the high schoolers, the graduating seniors, the girls and boys all alike, about only 30% of them will confess the marriage will be beneficial in their future. That's how negative view they have towards family and marriage. However, at the same time, there were studies done among married couples, listen, among the married couples, 60 to 61% of them will confess they are very happy. I was shocked. And also, among unhappy couples, if they endure for next five years, they are most likely will become very happy couples. If they do not give up to each other. Why? Because marriage is God's plan. It is God's desire for us to lead a happy life. But for us, understanding how God says, submit yourself and love your wives as your own body. And we honor His truth. And from that foundation, we can continually build strong and happy life. I stand before you as vulnerable as I can be. Because many of us, we grew up with a failed parents. Many of us grew up in broken families. Many of us had a distance or a father exited out of our life. And I read the article recently. If we grew up in a family where father exited out, there can be two symptoms appearing. One symptom is that exiting habit permeates into next generation. So he or she will easily wanting exit out of relationships. When there is a conflict, that person wants to exit out that relationship easily. For any areas of their lives, they want to easily give up. There is weak perseverance. The second symptom is because there has been puncture in my heart or because my father exited out. There is a severe scar and distrust built in my heart. So what I do, I become control freak. Because I cannot trust anyone, 
and my father disowned me, and I need to control relationship, and I need to control my circumstances. But deep inside, it's a sin. Why? Because that's unbelief. Because we cannot even trust God, who is a heavenly, eternal, loving Father who will never fail us. So if we can in allow Holy Spirit to enlighten our life, our hearts, if there's a scars, Lord, I confess. If there has to be forgiveness, I forgive. And there has to be blessing, and I bless. And that wounds and scars be completely healed. I have my bodily scars. There were some cuts of knives in my hands. Even though I see that scar, when I touch it, it doesn't hurt. Why? Because it's completely healed. In my heart, if there's a scar and it's not healed through forgiveness, if someone says anything, that touches that scar and I will react and I will scream. But in our family, recognizing each wounds, because we live in fallen world, no one is a perfect. But let's allow God and His truth to continually heal us, redeem us, and strengthen us because there's a hope. When we honor God, He's going to honor our family. Let us all stand. I know, being a father, I already said it to my children many, many times that I was sorry because I failed them. Recently, I failed them again. You know, I'm scheduled to go to Cambodia to teach at their seminary. Without me knowing, I purchased a ticket when my oldest son is graduating from elementary and my youngest daughter graduating from her kindergarten. And their dad will not be there. So, I am guilty. <laughs> no one can claim. No one can say, even though my parents have failed, I will not fail. We humbly must submit ourselves before God and invite His hands. And He's going to strengthen our marriages. Other than my own salvation, when I think about my own family, I cannot thank God enough because of what I have grown up in my own family without Christ. Now with the my family, by His grace, Jesus being in the center, is 180 degree difference. And I cannot thank God enough for family God has given to me as a treasure, as a gift. We are not perfect. I make mistakes. I fall and I fail. But one thing I tightly hold, God, you be our center. God, I honor you above anything else. Not my wife, not my children, not my ministry, nothing, not even my own life. You are my life and my breath. Can we call on the name of Jesus and ask God to bless our families, heal us, and also if you are single, God, teach me the way to prepare myself so that I can be a good mother and good father. Let's call his name. One, two, three. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus.